We, we wait too long to worry about profitability as entrepreneurs. Yeah. We, we, most of us didn't start the business to make a lot of money. We started it we, because we were, we, we felt compelled to, it was a calling for most of us. We were, we were, we were sick and tired of other people telling us what to do. We saw this opportunity. They wouldn't, somebody that we worked for wouldn't listen to us. So we said, well, screw it. We're going to go do it ourselves. Yeah. So that's why we started the business. It wasn't to make a lot of money, but to make sure that this entity that we've somehow created that's surviving actually is sustainable and thrives, we need to be concerned, really concerned about running a profitable business. This is the Wealthy Contractor Podcast, brought to you by G4 Marketing. Interviews with today's top home improvement entrepreneurs about marketing, sales, money, mindset, and lifestyle. Now, here's your host, Brian Kaskavalsian. All right, everybody, welcome to another episode of the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. This is Brian Kaskavalsian with G4 Marketing Group. And today, I have got somebody that is not a contractor. I know this is called the Wealthy Contractor, and I normally will uh, interview contractors. However, this guy that I'm going to um, interview, his name is Ed Epley. And Ed came to me through Matt Hollander from Hulco. And uh, Matt uh, has uh, become a friend and a client of G4. He's a speaker at Accelerate Live in 2021 and runs a phenomenal business, again, called Hulco in Tennessee. And when someone like Matt Hollander says, hey, you really have to meet this guy, uh, Ed Epley, I listen, and I reached out to Ed, and between our two schedules, we found some time to talk, and he had me within five minutes. Um, and so, Ed, um, that is your, you know, I told you I'm going to do like an informal bio. Um, listen to what this guy, hold on, listen to what this guy has done. So right now, he runs the Epley Group. Uh, which is a, I guess you could say it's a management consulting company. You basically help companies get better. Yep. All right. Listen to some of these companies that he's worked with. Goodyear Tire, BMW, Sarah Lee, Bloomberg, PSA Airlines. Now that dates you, my friend. I remember PSA Airlines. You know what's my favorite thing about PSA Airlines? What's that? the smile on the front of the plane. <laughs> they sold to somebody else. And that somebody else, of course, messed it all up. And they took the smiles off the airplane. What? Well, I, I don't remember that part. I just know them today as a wholly owned subsidiary of American Airlines. Of American Airlines. Okay, so yeah. that's where I've seen them. They do operate as PSA Airlines. That's right. But when I was growing up, PSA Airlines was a standalone on its own big airline. Okay. And all of their airplanes had a big smile under the cockpit. It went from know one that. side of the plane to the other. I did. I, I remember know. that. So, um, Ed, let's <clears throat> talk about, so uh, we can't not talk about 2020 and, and you, the listener, we are recording this at the end of 2020. You will hear it the first quarter of 2021. And so we will be off to the races with 2021, but I think we've got to kind of put 2020 into perspective. And I'd really like to get your take, Ed, mm -hmm. on what are you expecting in terms of business for 2021? You know, we've got a new administration that's coming in. Yep. Some people are thrilled. Yep. Some people not so thrilled. Correct. Us entrepreneurs, we don't have the luxury of sitting aside and hoping and waiting to see what happens. We got to keep barreling forward. That's right. So what what do you what do you think? What do you well, see? Tw twenty twenty is a, a really unusual year, uh, obviously for for a lot of reasons, um, <clears throat> but. The number one thing for me is that I've witnessed, Brian, is that organizations, unlike other downturns in the economy or challenging times, uh, 2020 clearly put people in primarily one of two categories. They were either in the tomb where their business was markedly hurt 
and 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 in a way that you know in some cases uh you know a number of companies have gone out of business uh, depending upon the industry and what your uh, mode of operation was you were you were really hurt by that um or in a boom so you have the tomb or the boom and boom means that you know you your business has not only survived but thrived and uh, so many in the contracting world have seen that happen yeah we've um, seen that in the home improvement space that's that's correct so i it, there really aren't too many uh i do i'm on a board of advisors for a very large um uh, con uh, uh construction management company uh, they do $350 million of projects a year. So, I mean, I get to see what they do and uh, get that side of, of uh, that type, type of exposure to that kind of contracting. Then obviously with Hulkel, I see what Matt's done and they've had a remarkable year um, and, and a number of other ones. So I've, I've witnessed this. And, um, and so my forecast for 2021 quite simply is this because 2020 has been such an aberration it has been such an unusual year by all standards um if you are in the tomb in 2020 you should expect a better year than that in 2021 if you were in boom in 2020 i think you're going to see something less than you had in 2020 in 2021 I, in other words i see reversion to the mean i think that We've, we've had this aberration. It's thrown the business either in high gear or in low gear. And now what we're going to do is go somewhere in between that for wherever your business was. I, I can't see it. I can't see if you had a record year in 2021, uh, 2020 that you're going to somehow, if you grew at 25%, it's awfully hard to grow again at 25%, even if you wanted to. Yeah. I have a couple of firms, Brian, who literally um, could replicate 2020 and 2021 but their suppliers won't allow them they literally can't get all the raw materials they need to replicate yeah. what they did in 2020 so I, I i just don't see it happening for most organizations and that also begs the question should you want to repeat as much growth in 2021 as you had in 2020 well and that's that's by the way to the listener when when me and ed were talking and you know, I was basically what I was doing was trying to see if he's, he would be valuable enough to you, the listener, to have him come on. Where he got me, I told you, he got me within five minutes was we had this conversation about how much growth is too much growth. Yeah. We, before we get into that, though, because that, that is, I, I like what you said here, but what concerns me a little bit and is probably the listener is going back to the mean. Yeah. And so, how do you um, let's use uh, let's use Hulko as an example because sure. you know he's in the home improvement space like many of the listeners are. Right. They experienced a, a boom year like many of my clients did. Right. What is your kind of advice to a company like theirs? What are you telling them in terms of planning for twenty twenty one? Um. A couple of thoughts to keep in mind, uh, and this is regardless of your kind of business, um, but in in the home improvement world, um, in particular, one of the things you always have to ask yourself is, um, uh, and, and think about it, is what's my cash flow? Yeah. What's my ability? Uh, and if you think about cash flow, it's the blood that goes through the entity that carries the oxygen to the organs so that they can do whatever they want to do. And when you're growing more than 15% a year, and for a lot of companies, it's more like 12, you tend to outrun your cash. So you're spending it faster than you're collecting. And that puts a strain on the business yeah. and it, it puts a strain on your banking relationship. It puts a strain on your vendor relationships um, you know, uh, your ability to c continue to invest in the business to keep up with the growth becomes more and more difficult or more and more, uh, more and more expensive because you really can't finance it just with your own uh, profitability. So you can have great growth, but you're outpacing the capacity of the cash flow to keep up with it. So, um, when I, when I think about Matt's business or anybody who's had a tremendously, uh, uh, a tremendous amount of growth in a year like 2020, where you're growing at 20% or more, um, that you got to ask yourself, what's the pain 
that I'm causing on the business by growing that fast, Brian. And a lot of times the owner, because we've spent so many years struggling to grow, when we when we get it, we we feel like a squirrel hoarding nuts. You know, it's just like I got to get another one. I got. We don't turn down business that we probably should in yeah. in a year like 2020. Um, and, and so it's almost like that old Fram oil commercial. You can pay me now or you can pay me later. Yeah, I know I'm really dating myself when I say that because most people don't think about that or don't even think about their oil filters anymore. But that there was a great commercial that said you can pay me now or you can pay me later. And when you grow as fast as 20 plus percent a year, year over year, my goodness, you're going to pay a price for that one way or the other. It's going to, it's going to strain the business. So, you know, what's really interesting about that number that you're, that you're saying that 20% number is because yeah. I, you know, there's so many people I talk to about, especially this time of year about what about next year? Yeah. What about next year? Where do yeah. you want to go next year? And, and my, my approach is different from most because my approach, like yours, this is, I, you and I have this in common is we're focused on profitability. I don't yep. care about the top line anymore. Uh, all, I only care about the top line as a function of uh, this is what I need in order to get the bottom line, right? Yeah. But I'm, you know, there's so many people, especially in the home improvement business that are, okay, I did 3 million this year. You know, whether they made money or they not, they didn't make money is now, you know, we'll get, we'll get to that later. But now they're saying, well, next year I'm going to go, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm investing in this and I'm investing in that. Next mm -hmm. year, we're going to go to 4 million. So we're going to grow by 35% or we're going to grow by 40%. Yep. Um, you're saying that 20% is tough. But, oh, yeah. And, and beyond that, you're talking about 12, 15. So is your... I know this is, I, I, we can't blanket it for everybody because everybody's experience and, and uh, place in business is a little bit different. But are you suggesting that people should not be that aggressive in their growth? Um, here's what I would, here's, here's the question I think you got to ask yourself heading into 2021. If, if you knew there was going to be a downturn a recession in 2022 or latest 2023 of, and let's just say if, if you knew there was going to be a downturn of at least 20% year over year, that, that whatever revenues you do in 2021, you're going to do 20% less in 2022. How would you run your business in 2021? What would you be focused on? Isn't that a little doom and gloom though? Yeah. It is uh, by, by a lot of standards, but you got to think about when's the last time we had a recession? Yeah. When's the last time we've had three quarters, at least in the, in the home improvement world, when's the last time you had three quarters in a row of less business than you've annually had? And yeah. most, most people can't remember the last time they had that, right? Right. It's been years. Yeah. So they're a lot closer to that next recession happening in the home improvement business than they are it not happening. Yeah. So I, I'm just, uh, look, you get to be my age. And one of the things that I wish I'd have thought about a long time ago was profitability. I wish I'd have focused more on profitability and I wish I would have focused more on risk. Me and too. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you, when you put the, when you take the risks that we take as entrepreneurs, and one thing I have in common with all your listeners, I've owned four different kinds of businesses, so it's not like I'm, you know, just coming at this purely from a theoretical uh, perspective. I've put my capital at risk to employ other people to try to make places where I've lived and worked better for the community and for the people who work for me. So I understand that. And, and when people say pressure, I say, if you haven't tried to, if you haven't had to cut checks for payroll and hand those out, knowing you didn't have money yet in the bank to clear those checks when, when they got deposited, you don't know what pressure is. Yeah. So, but, so yeah. it's interesting about that and why I reacted the way that I did is that 20 years ago, so I'm, I'm working on, as we speak, I'm working on our event for 2021, which is going right. to be the end of January. Right. And, um, one of the things that, um, I'm, I'm, I'm the guy out there in the industry that's saying, slow down, Yep. think about your profitability first, 
Whereas there's all these other guys running out there. They want to sell sales training and they want, and I got nothing against them. We need the sales training, but look, putting sales training and telling people, Hey, grow your top line, grow your top line, grow your top line without a focus on, well, why do you want to grow that much? What do you hope to get out of it? How much money do you need to make in order for you to live the life that you want to live and right. you know, get where you want to go? Nobody's having that conversation. And I look back and I say, my 52-year-old self, if I can go back to my 32-year-old self 20 years ago, I would ask them, why do you want to grow your business? How much money do you want to make? And how much risk are you willing to take in order to make that happen? Because yep. when I was 32, man, it was like, let's just grow. Let's sell more, sell, sell, sell more. That If I sell enough, I'll make enough. No, yeah. I was broke eight years <clears throat> later. I worked my ass off my entire 30s and I'm broke at 40. And I took too much risk and I ignored, I, I I hate to say it that way, but I did, and I knew better, and I, but I ignored profitability, and I didn't focus on it as much as I should have. So I'm glad you're you're bringing this up, because what you do have to measure the risk that you're willing to take against the payoff that may come from it. Do, do you think? Do you think most of the listeners pay any attention to their balance sheet? I hate to say, I hate to answer for them, but I'll just say from my own experience, when I was in my 30s and 40s, yeah, I didn't really look at the balance sheet. Yeah. I don't think most of them look at it. I don't, I don't think most of them understand it. But you know why? Most you of them wanna, care about it. And I, 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 you know why? One of the reasons why I didn't want to look at it, because I had so much debt. Yeah. I just didn't want to see it. It gets depressing. Yeah, because my profit model was broken. Yeah. And I thought, oh, I'll just sell more and that'll fix that. So if I have yeah. to borrow money, yeah. right, in order yeah. to keep the business running, that's fine because, oh, I'm going to make millions later. Right. Yeah. Uh, it, it, the way I view it is the, the, uh, uh, the balance sheet is really how sustainable your business is. What's its ability to weather the ups and downs of whatever is going to come at it? And I'm not a, I'm, trust me, folks, I'm not an accountant. I don't claim to be. Uh, all I'm trying to help you think about, though, as you, as you look at 2021 is, what's the, what's the ability of my business to withstand whatever's going to come at us? Yeah. Both in terms of the market that we serve, but also the, the global market. And there's a lot of volatility in the air right now. We don't know what's going to come at us and what, how much of it's going to be good or bad. But if you got a good balance sheet, then you're, you're in a uh, position to withstand whatever comes at you relative to your, to your competitors. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I pay attention to is your gross margin. What's your gross margin is the difference. Essentially, it's um, your, what, the, what the product sells for. And then after you take out the cost of goods, and the, in your case, the cost to install. Right. It's, it's basically you take those things out. What do you have left? And um, if your margins, your gross margins, not profit margin, but your gross margins are higher than your competitors, then you have a more sustainable business relative to your competitors. Right. Essentially, you've created a business that the market is rewarding more than your competitors. That's what it amounts to. So you're doing something right that the market is rewarding because you now have higher margins, gross margins than your competitors. And again, you can take more risk or you can play the game longer. Um, you can do an acquisition. You can do all these things your competitors can't do when those things happen. So I, I, I know I'm sounding a bit doom and gloom, but I'm also wanting people to think about, man, you know, if I'm going to put my money at risk, what should I get back for that? And, and, and to be fair, that was a trick question because I knew where you were going to go with it. This is not doom and gloom talk, people. This is opportunity talk. Yes. Okay. Think yes. of this as opportunity talk. And, and, what, and I agree with Ed entirely. It's, and, and what he's talking about was my experience back then. My business today is very different. It's, 
I try and model my most successful clients. So my most successful clients that are in the home improvement industry, they don't carry debt. Right. They don't need debt to fund their marketing. They don't right. need debt to fund uh, an ac- uh, uh, people acquisition. Um, th- they are funding all of that through cash flow. Right. And they're making enough to take out and build real wealth outside of the business, which is beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about today. But more importantly, like what you're saying is they are building so much value into what they do that the market, I like how you said that the market is rewarding them with higher margins. Yes. Yeah. And, And the other thing is most of the small home improvement companies are not businesses. Right. What what you have is uh, a, uh, somebody has created a really nice job for themselves. Yeah. And um, but if they went to sell it, the vast majority of your listeners would get less for their business than they currently have invested in it because the act, the, the, the person who buys the business would say, well, if you're not going to stay with it, the business is, isn't worth as much with you with you gone as it is with you present. Right. What you need to what, what all of us need to be striving for if we want to if we want to build something that's valuable to others. And I'm not saying we all should, but if you're trying to build something that others would want to buy, then the less you're involved in the day to day operations, the more it's worth to somebody else. Let's stop here and take a quick break. Now more than ever, you need a steady stream of profitable leads that are going to close easily and quickly with as little hassle as possible. Repeat and referral leads are the absolute best way to do that. But how do you go about generating more of these profitable leads systematically? At G4 Marketing Group, we have the whole process down to a science and we have it all written out for you in the Referral Success Blueprint. We are making this blueprint free to you as a listener of the Wealthy Contractor Podcast, so you can start generating more profitable leads for your business today. Just go to www.g4marketing.com forward slash blueprint. That's G-F-O-U-R marketing.com forward slash blueprint and download your referral success blueprint for free. Now let's get back to this episode. Yeah. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is maybe we have um, at a later time, maybe we come back because I have a feeling you have a lot of experience in the area of what builds equity in companies. Maybe you can come back and we can have a conversation about that because there are, I, and I was one of those. It's funny. You're, you're, you're talking to me. Because and I wish I had met you twenty years ago. Because I wish I had met me twenty years. ago. I know, really, right? <laughs> um, because twenty years ago, I thought, well, oh, it's okay. I'll just keep. I can borrow. Doesn't matter. Right. I'll just keep borrowing money because I'm going to sell this business for like. I, I had people. I had people that I had hired to help me grow this business who were telling me that, oh, we're going to sell this business for a hundred million dollars. Yep. Right. So, okay, so I could go borrow half a million. Who cares? I'll, right. I'll borrow five million. Right. If I'm going to make a hundred million, oh, come on. The business wasn't even worth three or four hundred thousand. And they're telling me, you know, oh, we're going to build this thing to a hundred million. But that all goes back to what do you want from the business? That's right. What do you want? How much yeah. money do you want to make? Because the business exists. And I tell people this all the time. The business exists to fund your lifestyle for your life. It's not about everybody else. They come after. The, if you do your business right, then you can take care of your employees. Then yep. you can take care of your community. Then you can go be charitable. Then you can go, <laughs> you know, put your face on a billboard and, and, you know, be famous. Build a business that supports your family first and gets your family what they want before thinking, oh, I'm going to go take care of everybody else, right? I'm sure, I'm sure you recommend this. Uh, so I, I don't want to suggest the audience doesn't already know this, but, but I really think this is a great time of year for an owner to write down a vision of what they want personally out of life. Not, out for, not from the business, but here's what I want my life to look like five 
10 years from now. I, I want these things going on. And, and I would list it as a set of conditions. This would be happening. This would be happening. This wouldn't be happening. Like, like five to 10 things that really would matter to you. And, and understand then what you're essentially defining what success would look like for you and the loved ones that, that you hold most dear. And you're saying these are the conditions that, that would tell me that I was being successful in life and that, that life was, was rewarding me and I was, I was getting from it what I want. Um, then you need to say to yourself, so how is my business designed to fulfill that? How, how likely is the business I'm operating going to take me towards this vision I have personally for life and living? And at, that starts to then go even a step further, Brian, to your point of, well, so what's the profitability that I need to be able to take from the business what I need and not harm the business to make these conditions happen in my personal life? So it's really a, a, a very much, you know, as Stephen Covey would have said, start with the end in mind. Yep. And then let's work backwards from that. Um, but it's also, if you think about, if, if, you, if your average listener is 40, let's just say they are. Another question you got to be asking yourself is, what do I, how do I want to leave this business? When, I, when I'm ready to leave it, what's my exit strategy? Am I going to close it down? Am I going to sell it? Am I going to turn it over to the people that have worked with me? What's my, but how do I get out of it? Because most people who started business do not think about how they're going to get out of it until way too late. And to make matters worse, a lot of them think, oh, I'll just sell it for a boatload of money. And most businesses don't sell. Nope. Because no one wants them. No one wants nope. to buy themselves a headache. No. It, why, should I, why should I pay you <laughs> for something I create myself um, and not have... To, to fix, right. to, to clean to fix up all of your bad decisions yeah, and all yeah. of your mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. That's that, that, that typically most entrepreneurs are bad at exit strategies because they're not really business people. They're really good at something and they've created a business out of it. And it, it's almost by accident. It's gotten legitimate. You know, most people who start businesses don't realize how absurd the whole premise of starting a business is. It's not rational because if we understood right. how, how unlikely it is for this business to be successful, we would never start it. I don't know if you and I talked about this when our, in our get together call. I don't, the average, most people don't understand how few companies get to $10 million a year in sales. Tell us because yes, you're right. Tell us. $10 million is a, is a magic threshold because it really starts to become a real business where you could actually sell it. Yeah. But only four tenths of 1% of all companies, less than half a percent of all companies get to $10 million a year. Think about that. That's so, just, that so let's put that into perspective. Yeah. So if you've got a thousand companies. Yes. Right. Yeah. Four tenths of 1%. So 1% of a thousand is a hundred. Is no, it's oh, oh yeah, you're right. You're 10. right. It's ten. That's right. That's right. right. You're right. You're right. So yeah, yeah. four tenths of one percent is four, right? Yes. Four. That's, now that's right. the other interesting thing is how many companies, and I didn't know this. This shocked me. But what percentage of businesses get to even a million dollars in sales? And that's four percent. Is that what it is? It's four percent. It's kind of funny how how that works, and it's the Pareto principle that. I've yeah. talked about here before, and I talk about it a lot because you can't fight the laws of nature, but it's interesting that you say that. And yet so many people that I talk to that are, well, when I get to this level, then I'm really going to start making money. And what they don't realize is that they may not have a, the ability to get there. They may not have the mental space to get there. They may not have the resources to get there. And forget all of that is you don't even need to get there. To, make, oh. to be in the top 1% of income earners in the United States and probably the world, you have to make like 400 and something thousand dollars. Well, in the home improvement space, if you follow our advice, which is a minimum 
15% net profit okay. model, right? In order to make $400,000, you only need a business that'll do less than $3 million a year. And right. you'll be in the you'll be in the top 1%. Now, if you want to make a million dollars a year, I have a lot of clients that are making a million plus a year doing it on a $5 million or $6 million business. Correct. What do you need a $10 million business for? It, it, yeah. <laughs> um, again, it probably goes back to how are they defining success? Right. And the average person who's running a business has really not decided how they're going to define success other than top line. Right. That's, that's really what it comes down to. I'm going to grow my way to success. And, well, and, and I'm sorry to keep cutting you off. That's right. You just keep saying things that I want to, I want the listener to, I want to give them an example <laughs> of it is you've been to events. I'm talking to the listeners. They've been to events where you've got all these people that are parading around that, oh, I did, how are you doing? Oh, I did 20 million last year. Oh, I did 30 million. I used to look at these guys like, oh my God, you did 20 million. Well, that was before I knew these people. Now I know a lot of them. And guess what? They're doing 20 million, but they're making 4%. Yep. Like, uh, really? Yep. You, 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 that, you're proud of that? Money doesn't like you very much. I mean, you know how to sell, but you don't know how to keep money. And, and like you said before about the risk and all of that, it's like, really? You know, and, and, and the problem with that is, is you've got these business owners that are looking to these people and thinking they've got it all figured out. Oh, so yeah. if I want to be like them, I got to do 20 million also. And that's where you're done. At that point, you're just, that's flawed thinking. It, um, if, if you think about um, what, what, how hard it is to run a business with 10 people. Yeah. <laughs> I know uh, how hard yeah. do you think it is to run a business with 20? Oh, uh, yeah. And, and, you know, you go from 20 to 40, it, it, the scale required to operate those three different kinds of businesses, the, the, the amount of energy required, it doesn't become easier. Um, it doesn't become simpler. It becomes more complex every time you add a human being into the equation. So um, not everybody's built to do that. Uh, uh, Clay Matil is the guy who used to own owned Imes Pet Food. Clay built that from a million dollars to almost a billion over about 30 some years. And he sold it in uh, 1999 to uh, Procter & Gamble. Sold it for uh, $2.3 billion. 30 30 times earnings he sold that company for. Wow. Yeah. It's a remarkable transaction that, that he was able to make happen. Um, Clay said something that was profound and it was, I, I thought he was talking to me when he said it, he wasn't, but he said, just because you own the business doesn't mean you're the right person to run it. Yeah. <laughs> and he brought in a guy to be his COO when the company was 120 million. And in five years, he took it from uh, 120 to almost a billion dollars. Yeah. And Clay would have never done that except his board said, you, you're not the right guy to take this business to the next level. And finally, after about a year and a half, they got him to figure it out. I'm saying that to our listeners simply because you don't have to be the person that runs the business day to day. Sometimes your best investment would be to pay somebody to come in and run the day to day operations because we might be better doing work than we are managing others. Well, we're, and this will take us off into a whole nother direction. We haven't even got, by the way, uh, to all the listeners, Ed's area of expertise is, is general entrepreneurship, yes, and all of that, but his real area of expertise, and he wrote a book on it is on um, management, uh, leadership. And uh, we haven't even got to that yet. And um, I'm looking at the clock. We might keep, are you okay to keep going? <laughs> I, I can go a little bit longer. Okay, too. we got we got to at least touch on it. And then we can, we'll, we'll do another episode. Um, what was I going to say? Oh, we are big promoters of, and, and uh, I guess uh, practitioners of, I don't know if that's the right, of EOS. Oh yeah, sure. entrepreneurial Here's, operating uh, system. Yep, yep. It's um, I, it's a overused term, but I don't know how else to say it. But for us, it was a game changer. Sure. Um, you know, we we uh, in in the in the EOS system, there's a role called visionary, and there, there's a role called integrator. In the example that you just gave, 
um, I'm sorry, what was his name again? Clay. Clay, Clay. was still, he, he's the visionary. He was the visionary. Yeah. He had to bring in an integrator in yep. order for the business to grow. Yeah. Funny enough, you know, to, 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 you're a visionary. Well, I'm a visionary to my benefit. I am actually my business partner is one of those unique people that has both skills. And it's very few people. I do not have an integrator skill in me at all. My business partner can do it. Now we are actually moving her into the visionary role, bringing on an integrator, and I get, I get moved out. Nice. Of it. <laughs> but what's funny is that you're absolutely right. I wasn't the guy to grow the business. No. When, I had, when I had the business, it was this size. Yep. But when, I, when they were through EOS, okay. when I was able to step away and my partner, who's also my wife, by the way, um, so it's good that I don't have to share the money. Um, well, I kind of do, but... No, you, you don't get the money. <laughs> I don't get the money, right. It all goes to her. Um, but um, yeah, when she came on, I mean, the business has grown by 300% over the last few years. Yeah. So it's interesting you know, that you say that. And that's one of the things that we talk to people about a lot, our owners is, is, and our clients, is to help them recognize, yeah, you may be, you are this, yeah. You're, you're the visionary. You should not be doing this. And the longer you do this, the more miserable you're going to be and the harder it's going to be for you to focus on what you need to be focusing on in order to get out of the business what you really want yeah. from the business. Yeah, at some point, every owner becomes the obstacle to the success of the business. Yeah, absolutely. At, at some point. I'm a, I'm a very good starter of enterprises. I can create something from nothing uh, and it's very intuitive for me. I don't have to think about it. I know how to do it. I just do it. Yep. Um, I've, I've recognized I can do it multiple times, but I get bored after starting it and I don't want to do the work that's required to scale it and to focus and to, and I don't want the hassles of people. You know, I, I, I've, I share this in, in the professional management work that I do. I'll, I'll, I, I, I'm not proud of this. But my attitude is kind of, if I have to tell you something more than once, then you're stupid. And, and if you're a manager and leader of people, you got to be willing to over-communicate and say stuff over and over and over and over again to, to really make sure it's understood and it sticks and that people know you're serious. Well, I, I, I don't, I don't want to do the work that's required to be a great manager and leader of an enterprise. It's just <laughs> that too. simple. I don't. Me too. Uh, and so I've been blessed that God helped me figure that out, that I was, I was not meant to be an employee of others and I was not meant to run a big company. And so I've been really fortunate to be able to have a, essentially a sole proprietorship uh, for, in one fashion or another for the last 20 years. So to the listener, there's nothing wrong with you. No. If you, got, if you probably have big plans and big dreams, but you are your biggest obstacle, um, it's okay. There's yep. nothing wrong with you. Yep. Uh, that's, that's you. That's the trait of an entrepreneur. But at some point, you got to say, hey, I got to move aside and I got to start putting people around me that can actually make this happen. And that's where we get into this leadership. You know, yep. how do you go from, you know, being the entrepreneur to, <clears throat> to really becoming a, a, a leader and growing people? Now, we're at a clock, um, but um, you're going to come back and we're going to talk about that another time. I think that this has been a very, very productive conversation, especially for, you know, first quarter of 2021. Um, you just have reinforced a lot of what we talk about here on the podcast, which is focus on your, on your profitability um, start there and then, you know, build from there. Um, I, I, I actually change, I change one word. I, instead of focus, I almost might say obsess, obsess, Good. obsess, Better obsess word. about profitability. Yeah. Oh, go I ahead. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I just, no, no, it's no, I, I'm, I like that. That's even better. We, we wait too long to worry about profitability as entrepreneurs. Yeah. We, we, most of us didn't start the business to make a lot of money. We started it. We, because we were we we felt compelled to it was a calling for most of us we were we were 
We were sick and tired of other people telling us what to do. We saw this opportunity. They wouldn't, somebody that we worked for wouldn't listen to us. So we said, well, screw it. We're going to go do it ourselves. Yeah. So that's why we started the business. It wasn't to make a lot of money, but to make sure that this entity that we've somehow created that's surviving actually is sustainable and thrives, we need to be concerned, really concerned about running a profitable business. Yeah. Um, do we want to talk real quick? quickly about your book and at least the structure or should we wait until next time uh we can we can talk about the, what the book covers some other time I, I would just say this number one i'm a big fan of eos i'm a big fan of any model that helps make simple the disciplines that somebody needs to embrace and use to run a business successfully. So EOS is one of the better ones. It's, it's great. I'm a supporter of it. I love uh, the way you put that. What's Can that? You say that again, the way you I, said it about the <laughs> disciplines. Okay. So to everybody listening, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go back and I'm going to rewind and I'm going to listen to what he just said about the disciplines. Cause that was, that was, that was really good Ed. what, what we want is, is a system that makes very simple and easy to understand the disciplines that we need to exhibit to operate a business. And, and so EOS does that professional management does that. So it's not, they're, they're not, uh, no one has a, uh, uh, exclusive secret sauce about what it takes to run a successful business. Those disciplines are well understood, but what EOS does, it makes it simple for people to get their heads around. What does that look like? And it makes it very clear. And it says it's very much a process that they help you understand that you learn to master and then you replicate it and you do it over and over and over again. And that's why you end up with a sustainable, thriving business. So it's just like selling. You need a model for selling. You need to have a, a, a set of rules that you follow when, when you're trying to sell something to somebody else to help them make a buying decision. And I don't care which system you use. I just care that you have one. My book, the same thing. Yeah. my book is really, and I wrapped it around a professional management model, but I could have wrapped it around EOS or anybody else's. But what it is, is I've captured for the reader in my book, what I've learned in 40 years about these disciplines and what I know to be true. Yeah. And I share with the readers uh, uh, really real life examples that I've experienced. And I talk very specifically about companies I've worked with or I know of who've done it well. And I use uh, other names to describe people who've not done it well. I protect the uh, the guilty, if you the will, guilty, by not, yeah. naming, not by naming them out loud. Yeah. So the, the what the book though is only 120 pages. What it does is it's a real quick read to help people to understand. Well, what does it look like when we lead, or what we talk about culture, when we talk about people development? So we'll, we'll get into that some other time, Brian. If you yeah. want to have me back, I'm glad to do it. But that's why I wrote book i wanted to I, at my age i wanted to get that down there and, and because i didn't you know hey, hey i could be gone tomorrow right right um so this has been fantastic uh, to the reader we will put this information in the show notes but you can find ed at and i'm going to spell his name for you it's the epley group.com so it's the t-h-e e-p-p L E Y group, G R U P. All one and, word. Yep, all one word, uh, dot com. Again, we'll put it into the show notes. Um, tell us real quick, you have an assessment, yep. a free assessment on your website. Tell yep. us real quick what that is and whether or <laughs> not it will be valuable for the listener. Yeah, most people want to know, well, how am I doing? You know, uh, am, I, am I average? Am I below average? Am I above average? So, so essentially what I've done is created a, a quick assessment. It takes about 15 minutes to go through. It asks about three to five questions per discipline about, is this happening or not? Is this happening? Is this happening? And based upon how you answer, uh, and you have a you know scale of one to five, essentially to answer the questions based on that, it gives you feedback about where you are and how much risk you have at, you know, not necessarily doing a discipline as well as you should. And so it gives you a sense of how much are you on track or not on track at doing professional management or EOS, whichever one you want to think about. Am I, am I doing this as well as I should, or, or is there opportunity to me to do it better that would help the business and, cool. it, and, and do it quickly? Cool. All right. So Ed, 
thank you so much. And I, I, you know, and to the listener, I can't wait to have Ed back because there's a bunch of stuff that we didn't even get to. <laughs> but I think that I thought that this was a very good conversation, especially again, going into 2021, you guys will be listening to this sometime in the first quarter of 2021. Um, and I'm going to do my best to get it out early. Um, so you can get, hear these words. Uh, but again, Ed, thank you so much. I appreciate you. I'm glad we met. I'm glad Matt uh, put us together. I see why, um, obviously, now. And um, to the listener, um, again, this great episode, I think, of the Wealthy Contractor podcast. And until next time, this is Brian Kaskavalsian with G4 Marketing Group. All right, so that's it for today's episode of the Wealthy Contractor Podcast. Let me ask you, did it help you look at your business in a new way? Did it spark an idea or ideas you hadn't thought of before? Do you have a list of action items that you can take and implement into your business or your life today? I really hope so. Now, before you go, make sure you subscribe to the Wealthy Contractor Podcast so you get access to the latest episodes as soon as they're available. We're always striving to provide you with great content so you don't want to miss what's coming up. And a favor. I'd really appreciate it if you'd go to iTunes and post a review of this podcast. Let us know how we're doing. The Wealthy Contractor Podcast is brought to you by G4 Marketing Group, where we help contractors of all kinds create customers, keep customers, and multiply their customers and profits. If you're interested in reaching new levels of success for your company, visit www.gfourmarketing.com or just call us at 305-856-8788 to schedule your free, no obligation, wealthy contractor strategy session. Now, during this strategy session, we're going to look at eight key performance factors in your business and we're going to help you uncover opportunities for growth, for leads, for sales, and for profit. And finally, we started the Wealthy Contractor as a resource to help you, the home improvement entrepreneur, regardless of where you are on the wealthy scale, get where you want to go. We want to provide you with the motivation, the confidence, the resources, and the tools so you too can live the life of the wealthy contractor. Now, the wealthy contractor is a place where it's okay for you to want it all. In fact, it's not only okay, it's encouraged. So until next time, this is Brian Kaskovalsian with G4 Marketing Group.